This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Saji Prellis is the Director for Children and Youth Programs at Search for Common Ground. Saji co-leads several policy-level platforms, including the UN Civil Society Interagency Working Group on Youth Participation and Peacebuilding and the Global Partnership to Enable Children in Youth Participation and Peacebuilding. Through the UNCSO Interagency Working Group, he has co-led the process in developing guiding principles for young people's participation in peacebuilding that was officially launched at the UN on April 24, 2014, and is currently co-leading the process to develop operational guidance on the same topic. Prior to search, he served as a co-founder and associate director at American University's Peacebuilding and Development Institute in Washington, D.C., and is currently one of the founding members and chair of the board for PDISL in Sri Lanka, an internationally recognized South Asian-focused training and research institution. Saji was born in Sri Lanka and holds a master's degree in international peace and conflict resolution with a concentration in international law from American University. I spoke with Saji in Washington, D.C. Hi there, Saji. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here with you. Where am I calling you today? You're calling me in Washington, D.C. Ah, so we found you at the mothership. Exactly. (laughs) Excellent. Saji, let's start out. Tell me what it is you do as the Director of Children and Youth Programs for the Search for Common Ground. The title of my position is Director for Children and Youth Programs, and Search for Common Ground is an international conflict transformation peacebuilding organization operating in about 35 countries around the world. So that's a fancy title, but basically what it really means is that I provide technical support to our field officers and uh, programs. I help in cross-fertilizing knowledge between countries based on lessons learned and good practice but I also help in uh, taking the lessons from the country level and trying to influence policy at the global level when it comes to enabling young people to be as, seen as peace builders around the world. That sounds like a heck of a lot of work. Are you always on the road? I'm always on the road, and but I have to say, though, to be honest with you, uh, the road trips are not so fun, but the work is extremely enjoyable, and I'm very passionate about it. Tell me about your the, the, your favorite program that you're working on right now, either in a particular country or a region, like a regional effort. There are two examples I can share with you. One is uh, something that is so current in our news news wave, airwaves right now is the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, for example. Despite the Ebola outbreak and the tragedy that is happening, that's plaguing all three countries in West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, we started a program earlier this uh, a few months ago. Uh, looking at uh, seeing how young people can, instead of being victims of worse forms of violence against them, how can they be engines of changing that dynamic? How can they be drivers of being the change makers of violence in their communities itself? So it's flipping seeing them as victims to seeing them as positive agents in addressing it. Is Uh, there a particular, you know, like the one story that you either, you know, use or that you just recently learned about of, oh, wow, this, this youth had this idea, wow, what a change. Is there is there a particular story you can think of off the top of your head? I mean, uh, there are lots of different stories. The main thing I can see is uh, how, despite the enormous challenges people are facing, uh, young people are experiencing in this context, the Ebola outbreak, they are saying that they want to continue to work on these programs, they want to continue to engage because they want to be seen as partners as, and as leaders in their communities. And they're not shying away from challenges and risks and conflicts. And they actually want to actually engage in these ways. So, And so what would, what would SEARCH provide to these youth as support or as direction or as resource in order to help them engage, be leaders, and take action for change? SEARCH provides a number of different things. One is at the capacity level, training level, skill level. We, are, we provide them with skills and capacities to see themselves as leaders, not just among their peers, but at, as, at a societal level. And then we try to use radio as a tool to actually articulate that voice or amplify that voice across the country so more and more young people see that there are young people as champions for them. That's one level. The other level is taking those voices and influencing policy, working with UN agencies and others to really convince them that there are more and more young people who are actually not picking up guns, but actually choosing nonviolent means of transforming and addressing issues that, that are plaguing society in these countries. 
because oftentimes we tend to focus on the troublemakers, the few people who cause trouble at the cost of leaving all the, the many more who actually choose not to commit violence. So what we show is the other side of it. So we uh, focus on those who, many more who actually choose not to commit violence and actually show that that's more of a leader than actually the few people who actually cause trouble. Does that make sense? That makes, that makes perfect sense. How do you get this word, you know, the word of, of these good acts or this initiative out there? I mean, if I'm thinking about what I listen to on the news today, it's it's still tragedy. It's still, you know, how come resources aren't showing up in the Ebola countries? How come, you know, there isn't more action? The the story you just told is being lost in sort of the, the what you'd call the typical media. Is there is that a constant frustration for you or is that something that you have a different path to get the word out? It is a frustration because we don't control the airways like that. Uh, we don't have the resources for it. But what we are trying to do is create the channels, create the mechanisms for uh, to create those alternative voices to be more popularized. And we are, we are entering in a, into a society where these types of alternative voices are needed and actually are considered to be a breath of fresh air. But the Platforms are not there all the time. So we are actually starting to create platforms. We have been creating platforms in a number of countries we work in, using radio, for example, or television, popular culture um, tools to actually engage young people, but create those conversations not for only young people, but also for the adult counterparts or adult beauty bearers to pay attention to and see that what young people are articulating, the world that they want, is not too different from the world that the adults want. It's not too different from the policymakers want. It's about building that trust on a longer term basis, and that takes some time to actually enable those conversations to ripen. In 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 Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea right now, these are young people figuring out what needs to be done at the country level to address violence, and then engaging their peers, engaging their policymakers, ministers, and other duty bearers to say, here's what our role is. How can we then work together to address this? So that's the next step that that in a lot of places we are doing. How did you find yourself as the director uh, of Children Youth Programs at Search for Common Ground? You spent <laughs> quite a bit of time at American University. Um, before that, you had a couple other uh, uh, positions that you held. Take us through where, you know, was it always a conscious decision for you that you were going to go in and do sort of development, community building, peace building work? Or did, did you find your way into this work some, some other way? I kind of walked myself into it, but I had no grand plan of saying this is where I need to be. My experiences come from, the, I mean, his passion comes from growing up in Sri Lanka, growing up in a conflict, seeing the ugly side and the good side of human nature unfolding in front of me. Uh, and as I came to the U.S., I had this burden of that I carried with me saying, you know, I've, I had this experience. What do I do with that experience? So. But when I came here, it was, oh, I need to help people. So I started thinking of medicine as a, you know, as a career path. So biology was where I started. But changed my major about five or six times, and I still continue to change my field. But all, all around is about focusing on how do you create enabling environments for people to find solutions themselves. And that goes back to my upbringing in Sri Lanka, is as somebody coming from Sri Lanka, I always thought the solutions came, are better coming from outside, but I realized the solutions already are inside of us, inside the countries itself. How do we create that enabling environment for us as people from local communities to discover those things and then amplify those solutions to be the way to actually address issues that are dividing societies? So that's the journey I had. And But from an academic side of things, I kept changing majors, trying to figure out where I fit in. So it came from biology to political science to psychology to international relations to peace and conflict resolution to international law. All those were me discovering who I am. And the more I learned from it, the more I realized that I have a lot to add to the conversation. But that journey was a very crisscross journey. There was no clear journey that came to where I'm at right now. And what was the work that you were doing at American University for 10 years at the Peace Building and Development Institute? I was directing, I founded, we co-founded and directed the Peace Building and Development Institute at American University with a professor named Mohammed Abunima and many other people who helped make it happen, was to really try to bridge theory with practice and also really try to explore the nexus between the work 
peace building does as well as development do and how do you kind of find the middle ground between good peace building and good development recognizing that you can't do good peace building without development and cannot do good development without peace building and to do a training courses around a variety of topics but in the nexus of peace building and development so we organized these trainings and brought people from an average of 25 countries around the world put them in touch put them in the same room as master's degree graduate students taking these courses and enable them to build the skills that they need to actually become more responsible and active practitioners in the countries they're working in do you think that the formative experience you had in Sri Lanka during the civil war was has that something that you carry with you every day and has that been a critical factor in your ability to communicate and make the situations real, at, you know, for when, when you're working in, in uh, Search for Common Ground, where you're working at American University. Where I'm going with this question is, mm-hmm. how does that work with some of your colleagues who haven't experienced these things firsthand? To me, to be honest with you, there are two things that are really moving me. One, one is, like you pointed out, my experience growing up in Sri Lanka and the conflict and the being witness to the really ugly side of human nature and the good side of human nature really painted a clear picture for me. But there was another story, another set of experiences after the Asian tsunami, how people were affected by the tsunami, but more importantly, how people were responding to it really shaped my worldview as well. It came back to that realization that oftentimes the first responders, oftentimes the victims, but also the perpetrators of good and evil or all locals. It's about how do we create that enabling environment for people locally to actually shine, but how do you promote the good things than the bad things? So that was my operational um, compass, so to say, in the work I was doing. But as I came here and I learned and engaged with lots of people here, what I noticed is that a lot of people in this country come with fantastic ideas with very good intentions, but sometimes don't forget that, but they forget that they are outsiders coming in. And oftentimes it's about reminding... Tell me, tell me more about that. What do you, you mean the, the consultants coming in or... So what I mean by that is consultants or experts from outside coming in to countries that are affected by conflicts or natural disasters and coming with very good intentions to help. But oftentimes when they come in with those good intentions that they miss a lot of vibrancy and the strength and the resilience and the capacity that already exists. Mm -hmm. And that actually sometimes ends up doing more harm than good. So I think we have to remember as responsible practitioners with very good intentions that when we enter countries or work with partners in countries that it's our, our job to actually bring out that goodness that people already have, bring out the strength and the resilience people already have and, and support that more so than trying to bring in outside solutions. I'm not saying that outside solutions are, are not good. I'm saying that there are a lot of in, uh, indigenous solutions that sometimes are neglected at the cost of foreign outside solutions because we are not investing enough into that into the local solution. So those are short-lived because they are project-based in some sense. Is there a particular story you could share with us or a moment of one of those neglected situations where you, know, you saw it happening and said, oh, you know, if only you know, we would have gone this other path and listened rather than you know, taking this standard path or, or this, this outside path? Is there a particular story you can think of? Hi, I can, and it may be controversial right now, but I'm, I'm not afraid to share this. Uh, going back to the tsunami in Sri Lanka, uh, the first responders were young, local people, young people coming to help, bringing food, helping with triages, helping with rescue efforts and stuff like that, and re- search and rescue efforts. And what people were doing was volunteering their time. And for several weeks, that was the case. But when the international communities came in to actually help in the response efforts, what they did was they saw all these people doing work. What they did was equate time with money and created a cash for work program. Mm. And the cash for work program, what it did was it spoiled the uh, indigenous form of volunteerism that is innate in our culture and put a dollar figure on it. And that actually spoiled people's efforts and everything was about then, oh, I'm putting my time, so I need money for my time. And it destroyed that fabric of volunteerism. It destroyed the fabric of people doing service for the goodness of others. 
and and that 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 was the, one of the poignant moments of my life to realize that it is a good missed opportunity by the international community to see how they can enable local civil society enable local communities to actually do better by supporting those efforts instead of coming with their pre determined uh, project f- frameworks and putting it in and saying we are doing a cash for work program that was an example where it, it, it was a missed opportunity. Thank you for that. Why, why youth right now? Is there a particular reason why you've focused your particular position at Search, or you 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 know you're, you're working right now with youth? It, you were an educator in the past. You've been doing training in the past. Why youth now? It's the question is why not youth? Uh, more so than why youth. If you look around the world, there are 50 plus percent of the population in most of the countries, most of the developing countries. They are, we've been, you look at young people, I'm talking about children, adolescents, and youth, they constitute a majority of the population in most of the countries we are working in. Uh, for example, you're looking in a place like Congo, where 70% of the population is young. In Pakistan, 75% of the population is below the age of 30. It's a youthful population. And we look around the world where social movements have played a role. It's oftentimes more, so more than governments, more than international actors and others. The biggest influence in the society have been people. And these people have been young. And they actually see the world very differently than traditional actors do. And the world they see is more uh, horizontal. The leadership models are more horizontal than vertical structures. The the world they see is something of justice, something of equality, something of serving of everybody than just themselves. And that world is what I want to be part of. That's the kind of world we want to support because that's what actually enables the human race for all of us to actually succeed. So that's why I'm part of this process. And most of the countries we work in, it's young people are the ones who are able to see the differences, understand the difficulties, and see how they can actually find common ground among the differences than actually perpetrate the violence itself. So they are already the peace builders. So it's why not empower them? Why not enable them to to show the world that what they're actually capable of? If we enable them historically, there is evidence that AI supporting young people, there is stronger political stability, st- stronger economies around the world if actually you enable young people to actually shine. Mm. And actually, so why not be part of that movement? You have mentioned a couple of times evidence and working with some of these great solutions that youth have put on the table and how that shapes society. How does search go about measuring its success? Or do you have particular indicators that you look for? Do you have particular systems you use? Is there a is there a process that you are proud of that good question. I think the whole field of peace building has become more and more professionalized and become more accountable in this process. And oftentimes it's very difficult to measure uh, the notion of peace, the notion of co- uh, coexistence. Uh, it's more challenging than the public health, for example. You can see how many people you're feeding, how many tents you're building, how many immunization, how many people you're immunizing. That's a quantifiable indicator that is much easier to do. It's very, very difficult to see to measure the degrees of trust people have among communities that have been torn apart by violence. Um, so for us, we approach this by understanding uh, the the reach we have in our programs, the resonance it's having in our populations and the response people are building based on that reach and response, uh, uh, resonance it's having. So we measure, to, for example, that way. We measure by looking at uh, the degree of uh, uh, understanding people have about the div- divisions that they see. And they you know, try to, and while we don't have the perfect solution yet, and as a field, we are still maturing. We are still learning how to do this even more, even do it better. From a youth perspective, I think, one of the things that we've been really kind of pushing for is how can we be, become more youth-led uh, but technical-advised approaches to be to, to flourish? How can you design youth-led approaches to flourish? And in that context, how can young people become part of the design? How can young people be part of the management process? How can young people become part of the evaluation process uh, that can actually lend itself to giving new information that a traditional approach like a survey tool or a, or a focus group cannot discover. So we've been digging into and creating new methodologies around this that a lot of other people are also uh, testing out as well. Take me through a typical day for you. 
if there is one. <laughs> There's no typical day. Uh, I'm sure something. you don't give interviews to uh, podcasts every day. So what's it? Take take me through the different kinds of initiatives you're working on, and 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 where, where most of your time is spent. So most of my time, like let's take last week for example, this you know the day started with a staff meeting with a couple of meetings with uh, my colleagues from the Congo where we are working on a disruptive innovation summit on youth violence prevention and then led to uh, a meeting around creating a, a social movement around how young people can be engines of change and how can we create a whole global movement around it to get people to feel like they belong to some they belong to something greater than themselves and they're part of shaping something greater than themselves and how do you do it in a social way that is a global movement and we started to discuss around that um, so that was another, you know, a couple of meetings around this, and that led to uh, a conversation with my colleagues from Pakistan and in Timor Leste uh, around one is around youth violence prevention in Pakistan, in Kakash, uh, Islamabad area, and actually and Karachi area, and in Timor Leste working with gang members. How do you actually get gang members to be part of society and enable them to become? social actors contributing to their communities. So it was that was a typical day and a half of work and driving some of these initiatives forward. So plus addressing 200 plus emails you get a day and that's a full-time job. <laughs> uh, the 200 plus emails a day. That's <laughs> good to hear that you are on par with everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much of your time is divided between helping to raise funds for search uh, implementing technical work and doing administration. How do you divide your time among those three responsibilities? It comes with the flow and you take the punches each day So, uh, of what the priorities might be. But generally, I spend about 40 or 50% of my time on the technical side, 30 or so percentage of my time on for policy work, and about 10% on the fundraising. Have you noticed that fundraising has become more difficult, or how is Search uh, approaching fundraising in, a, in in any unique way that um, has helped you to sidestep some of the donor constraints that are happening these days? By the challenges, Search has actually been successful in raising money in a number of countries and work and supporting some a lot of our programs. So. Uh, for us, because of the work we are doing, it has actually it, uh, this work speaks for itself at the country level. And I think one of the main reasons for that is because the work we do is really in partnership with a lot of local organizations, local civil society organizations, youth organizations, and others. So it's about promoting them, enabling them to be the actors, so to say, or the, or the engines that are driving change in a good way. So. A lot of donors are also shifting in that direction, and we've been, you know, really leading in that process. So for us, it has been not a whole huge challenge. But said that, I mean, globally, you know, the giving habits of donors are changing, and the amounts of money is also changing. Uh, and as international actors, we need to be uh, attuned to those things. So far, we have not been totally hurt by it, to be honest with you. But the fundraising landscape is, for us, for me personally, is, uh, is a challenge because it's about how do you support local efforts versus how do you pro promote and support global efforts and or policy efforts. So balancing that act at the fundraising level is not often easy because the instinct is to actually always support local efforts. But there's a need to actually also support global efforts at the policy level that create that enabling environment at a policy level for young people also. So it's that balancing act that is not often easy to determine, but it's based on country and context and priority each day. Yeah. Are there any unique fundraising approaches that Search is using, such as uh, sort of social enterprise type things, or other than going and seeking you know, traditional seeking donor funds or seeking you know, essentially writing proposals on tenders? Sure, I think I think generally that's our bread and butter. We actually writing proposals at the country level or regional level and getting funding. Another approach is actually solicited proposals where donors come to us and say we are interested in this effort. Can you work with us on something? The other is actually working in partnership with donors to co-create things together. That's been rather successful in a couple of our MENA, Middle East and North Africa countries where we've done some of this work, working in partnership, creating these part, uh, relationships to do things together and initiatives. And the other is 
this on this more social side of things, you know, creating this innovation uh, hub, so to say. And one of them is in, in the process. We are doing it in Pakistan, Nigeria, and in the Congo, looking at uh, disruptive innovations on engaging young people as peace builders and engage how can young people become agents for stopping violence or re- uh, mitigating violence in communities and trying to find innovative solutions, disruptive solutions to it. So that actually creates another approach of bringing partners on board to find solutions that are completely never been discovered before or taking something and, you know, changing it so much that it's a new it's a, it's a new approach in itself. And that's some things we are testing out. We just did that in Nigeria we brought musicians and social media influencers and governors and security people and others together to talk to each other about what can be done in the streets of Lagos and came coming up with new solutions around that. So it's about bringing uncanny partners together to do that. And that's something that we are you know, really trying to test out even more on. Mm-hmm. You've had something of a very successful career and you are you know, you've reached what many people would consider to be a pinnacle, you know, a director level at a, a fairly prestigious organization. What's the next five years look like for you? Next five years is an interesting question because uh, I honestly don't know where I will be in five years. But the next five years, I can get, I can guarantee that I will be actually very involved with shaping and influencing the international youth policy and youth and peace building policy frameworks. Imagine a world where we have a Security Council resolution on youth in conflict situations, influenced by the women, peace, and security architecture that actually creates a policy framework that donors, governments, and others can understand how better to invest in its youthful populations better. Imagine a world where... Tell me about... So help me imagine that world. What what would that change? What... Give me... uh, Can you give me a concrete example of how having that guidance and having that policy framework would change the investment structure so, in youth? So, so a policy framework that recognizes the, the uh, uh, critical role young people, young men and women play in peace and security work. And at a policy level, there's a security council resolution, for example, on youth, youth, and peace, youth peace and security, for example, that enables donor agencies and governments at a policy level to recognize, just like they had recognized the role of women in peace building, they recognize the role of young young men and women also in peace building. That means there's more funding allocated to it, there's better policies formulated around it, but also there's a, 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 a movement to actually create better data and more uh, more better data and better programming to actually support and enable young people to act in those, uh, to support them as peace builders. So there's a, a, just like what it has done to the women's movement around the world, it actually can do the same thing even more more for youth movements around the world because because of the social nature of it. So I think that's the benefit of it. There will be better quality programs, stronger evidence to support the investment of young people will be also part of that world. And taking you back to that five-year question, so you, yeah. you're contributing these policy frameworks. Does is there a next level for you at search? Is there uh, maybe another initiative you'd want to start, or maybe I, maybe this is a great place for you to be? It, you know, change doesn't come overnight. Change comes in, in, in a little by little. Is that that those things come? So for me, I see myself very intimately involved in the youth and peace building field for a while, really trying to shape the architecture, really trying to create the frameworks to actually make that happen. So I'm not ready to jump ship. I'm not ready to change uh, my field into something else. But I think uh, these these things need to institutionalized. These need these efforts need to be institutionalized, and that institutionalization process takes time. So it, it, you need to be able to be patient and really pushing these things in a very patient way. So for the next five years, that, that that's where my path is is really trying to create the instruments, the architecture, the, the, uh, and the frameworks for actually really creating that enabling environment for policymakers, stakeholders to see young people as partners in nation building or peace processes. Over those five years and over the last you know, 15 or 20 years you've been working, what has been your biggest frustration about being a development professional? Is it the travel? Is it the pay? Is it politics? Is there too much work? You know, one of the times when you, you know, sometimes you want to just wring your hands and say, 
I'm, I'm done. I'm going to work in the private sector. <laughs> like, when, when does that happen? Hmm. Or, maybe, or has it ever happened? It ha- I haven't really seen it that way. That's why I'm struggling to answer that question. There are many frustration points. I think uh, sometimes I feel like there's too much money in this field, but it's not enough money going in the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes, uh, the solutions are same old solutions and with plenty of information that those solutions never work, but yet we invest in those solutions because we think that those are the best solutions that we can think of and that actually does more disservice than uh, service to communities that are torn apart by conflict. Uh, so my frustration is that we are not innovating enough. We are not challenging each other to learn from past practices. We keep seeing, you know, lessons learned, but it's uh, but we more better question to ask is lessons unlearned in this process because we keep learning the same lessons, but we are not absorbing and institutionalizing those lessons into our practice. Mm. Uh, we also know that better collaboration and coordination actually helps in the humanitarian and peace building field, but yet we struggle to collaborate and coordinate because it's a comparative model that we have, we are living in, where we compete for money, very limited money, and then we actually do our own work without promoting everybody else's work. I think that though that's the, that's the frustration. But it also, the inspiration is the flip side of that, where when you work with young people, they don't really, this is what I said, young people's leadership model is more horizontal, not vertical. Traditionally, adults tend to see leadership model in a very vertical kind of way. Young people see the world and the leadership model they uh, see is a more horizontal one where everyone has an equal say in things. And that's the world I want because that's where most of the work, actually, the good happens there, not in the bureaucratic bureaucracies that tend to get stuck in the old ways of doing business. Tell me about a time that you failed. We're all really good at talking oh, about our successes, but, but tell me about a time you fell flat on your face and what did you do to either recover or pick yourself up and dust yourself off and keep going? There are tons of things I've failed in. Actually, I think that's, I am a big proponent of failure more than success because it humbles people. It enables you to reevaluate your ideas and actually learn from them uh, more so than success does. So I'm a brick proponent of failure, and I've failed in so many different things. Give me, give me a particular story. What's your favorite one to tell? So <laughs> more recently, uh, an idea I had was creating a youth-led research and evaluation project. And I thought I had the whole structure organized, and I got the training going to get young people trained in how to do it. But I failed in understanding how to do the analysis part. I didn't figure out how to do it, and I thought it will it will work itself out. Young people will be able to figure it out themselves, but I failed in recognizing that they need the guidance themselves. They need the strength, the skills to actually do a good analysis, and that's a rigorous analysis takes some time. I short-sighted it completely, and I thought I had everything ironed out, and a lot of people were saying, Sajid, there are things that you're not, you're missing, and I said, no, 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 I've got it figured out, but I, I completely messed up on that because I didn't listen to enough people but my own voice and uh, the voice of reason from other people I didn't hear because I was sold on the fact that uh, I trusted the process but the process was rigged from the beginning because a piece of it was not considered careful enough. That's the In the process of a research process, the analysis piece was not carefully thought through. So that was a big failure on my part. Mm. Uh, in the Peace Building Institute, when we were working on trying to bring people from different countries, you know, constantly there was a failure. Every single year there were failures on how we manage things, how we got the trainings going, how we brought, you know, got people to come here. We tried all kinds of different ways to bring people to the to this country from conflict-affected areas where it was not easy to get visas. But when we came here, you know, they were part of the training process. And uh, sometimes there were complaints that the training wasn't meeting their needs. And it's a balancing act of making sure that uh, the first few days was not about measuring the failure of a course. It's about measuring the failure or success of a course at the end of a course, not at the beginning or the middle of a course. So making mistakes at the early stages of training design was a really good experience for me because when you do a training, there are lots of complaints at the training where people are being, oh, this training is not meeting my needs. But if I, because I listen to them at the early stages, 
I tried to influence the training, which was a bad mistake, which I should have trusted the instructors to wait till the five days were over to actually see how to adjust it. And um, I realized that a lot of people have different expectations and trying to please too many people can end up actually failing many people than mm. a few. It's that I don't know if that makes any sense to you. but Absolutely. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think we probably, uh, many of the people who are listening to this uh, have been guilty of, you get into a group of people, you get into a room and there's a few loud voices or a few people who you know speak up and so you try to adjust to to satisfy the needs when you really just need to stay true to the yeah the agenda that you had because it's you know you're working with the group not just with those individuals exactly and, and as a student i fail in many many times many things you know as uh, trying to figure out the right major, trying to figure out which club to org- belong to or organization to be part of, which projects to take, in, uh, make priority. The, all those things, when I was in student government, we were trying and, you know, it's through those failures that we were able to actually succeed. Mm-hmm. Is, so, there, is there one thing, you know, as somebody who travels all the time, you've been all over the world, you work with people all over the place, is there something that you bring with you, uh, you know, that you, you never leave home without? Either, you know, your favorite scarf or, you know, something that you put in your briefcase. <laughs> now, uh, my computer, which I can't live without, and my phone so I can keep in touch with my family, uh, which is always nice. When you are traveling, the hardest thing about traveling is the family that is behind and missing those moments with your family, your wife and others, you know. So it's hard to recreate that. So we use technology to uh, do that. So those are the, that's what I miss. I take with me is my phone, so I can be in touch with my wife when I travel. Two more questions for you. First sure. of all, first one, you've you've already told us some great stories about the tsunami, about other places. Is there a go-to story if you and I were, you know, having coffee right now in D.C. Uh, and you didn't know we we didn't know each other, and this was the first time we had met? Is there a go-to story that you have about? That one time when you were in Liberia, you know, and it was the side of the road and the truck broke down and something great happened. Is there is there a story that you like to tell? Many stories. One thing that really pops up is goes goes to Sri Lanka right after the tsunami. Uh, after, there was a month after the tsunami. Uh, we were traveling to about 75% of the tsunami hit areas and we were in this school. It was in the afternoon. And we ended up talking to this young boy named Pathum. He was about 12 years of age. And he describes in vivid detail how he witnessed his mother getting slammed by the wave and dying. How he saw his father buried, you know, buried alive in the water. And his grandmother also in the same kind of way dying. And he witnessed those things. And yet two months later, he was wearing blue shorts and a white shirt black socks and black shoes, combed hair sideways, side parted, and sitting in a classroom, and here he's talking with me. And I think about that example and look at Katrina, and uh, two months later, how many people were in school? Not many. So here in Sri Lanka, he's already in school, despite the tragedy, despite the loss he has experienced. And when I, I, after all that details of him describing the loss, I ask him at the end, and I'm in tears while I'm talking to him, uh, because I'm sad of how, what he has experienced. I asked him, what, Pathum, what is it that you want? And he looks at me and says, I want to stay in school. I know my parents are not alive, but I want to make them proud. Because if they were alive, they would be proud if I was in school. I want to do good. In, I know I want to do good by them. And that made me tear up even more. So I said, well, my first thing is, how can I help you? What do you need? And what he tells me was, what I need is my sister who is studying for her O-level exam, a British O-level exam. I need for her, she lost all her study notes. I would love if you can help get her start, get study notes for her so she can sit for her exam and finish up. Here's a 14-year-old boy. When you ask him what he wants, he wants to stay in school. When you want, ask him what he needs, What he needs is for his sister to study, not for him. The selfless nature of that uh, example really left a lasting legacy for me. Pathum's selflessness. 
of we, we, despite the loss, despite the tragedy, despite the devastation that surrounded him, what he wants is somebody else to benefit from whatever I could have done at that moment. You know, that speaks volumes of so many young people that I've met in other places also, whether it's in Nepal or Liberia or Congo. It's a simil- there's a similar story that young people have. It's a story of resilience, a story of rising from the ashes, of wanting to see how the world that they want is a place that is better for them and people around them. And that is what gives me hope. And that's what gives me the keeps me passionate and committed to do this kind of work. Final question is one that we ask everyone who is a guest here in terms of reference. And that is, uh, you know, you've created success as a development professional for yourself. There are many, many people who either are completing a master's degree right now or want to transition from a different sector into development work. What's the, the, the or, or some of the critical advice that you would give to them about what they should do to be successful or what they should look at to, to get that first job or to help in their career? For students, I, uh, it's a, this is a question that I, I mean, this is a conversation I have with many students still, uh, even though I've been out of school for a while now, is that <clears throat> their job search starts the job that start, when they start their, say, for example, master's degree. It's a two-year program. Their job search starts on day one. They start their master's degree program, for example, because if it, whether it's in D.C. or elsewhere, it, they need to have a strong network of people they know and, and, and partners they work with or help, support. So knowing people really helps. Knowing people alone is not enough. Having good experiences, working in different place, countries also helps. Having language experiences helps. But more importantly, also what is useful is being a good writer. What I've seen is it's very difficult to find really good writers these days. Having writing skills is a fantastic skill. Part of this is creating a brand around yourself, right? It's more difficult to get jobs these days in a competitive work environment. There is more people applying for jobs than the jobs that are available. So how do you stand out from the crowd? So you create a brand that makes your CV more memorable, so it doesn't become the same CV as 200 other people's CVs. You will need to stand out from the crowd, and we have to, be, people have to do a much harder job in actually making that happen. So online, whether it's on LinkedIn or on others, really creating a profile that is it's full and complete, and then a CV that doesn't look the same as 200 other CVs is also very, very important. So that's why when we look at CVs, what we remember, it stands out. That helps us because it's a way of you communicating your skills and your capacities uh, in a way that's, you know, is different. And the other thing is don't take the traditional paths of, you know, bachelors and masters and PhD to get a job world. The job world is very changing so rapidly that the same equation that worked two years ago or five years ago is not the same today. People are being more entrepreneurial. So those uh, walking those new paths taking risks and doing things differently against the grain, I think paints that picture even better for you. And the story you can tell from that makes you more of an appealing candidate for jobs and consultancies and stuff. Um, so, and then in the, in the in just kind of continuing that trend, I think is uh, the, the notion of brand. I think a, a, the brand, your profile, is something you need to carefully think about and shape because there's more people competing for jobs. So that brand has to be really well thought through and what your expertise is and promote that brand in a way that actually gets your name out there, whether whether you're writing blogs and promoting other people's stuff or writing uh, articles into the Chronicle of Higher Ed or into the Huffington Post or the Guardian. Get your name out there. That's a really important way of contributing to society and also being recognized as an expert in the subject area that you're committed to or passionate about. Because those things really help on the long run than just the traditional degrees alone will help you. Saji, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I'm so glad I got this opportunity. Thank you so much for inviting me. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes.